What happens when you take a tool like keto or fasting or a high protein diet too far and it begins to cause cortisol issues? Is there a way to reverse out of that and not gain a lot of weight and still feel healthy? Well, today's guest is gonna answer all of those questions for you and more, so stay tuned. Welcome back. This is the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. I am so grateful that you're here. Thank you again for watching. Today's guest is my friend, Jeremy. Now, Jeremy is near and dear to my heart. He is someone that reached out to me when I did my very first leptin reset cohort back in June. And he was really, really struggling at the time with major leptin resistance, just no satiety signals, was miserable, was dealing with binging and you know, his story just really got to my heart because I had actually dealt with a lot of these issues myself. And these are issues that I see clients coming in with more and more as things like keto and fasting, which we talk about in this episode are not horrible, but if you do them too much or too extreme, you can really, really cause issues. So we're going to talk about his journey. Jeremy is a registered nurse and lost over 160 pounds using keto and fasting. So we don't want to throw these tools completely out but we wanna talk about the flip side of some of these tools and when they're not used appropriately and safely, how this can cause issues. Again, Leptin Reset program is where I met Jeremy. He's gonna talk about that experience. That program is available. If you listen to this and you're like, this is me, I need some help. That link is gonna be down in the show notes and you can use code podcast to save 10% on that at any time. I'm also running a live cohort in January for anybody who has done the leptin reset with six coaching calls, as well as a private group held off of Facebook. If you have done the program or want to do the program and need more support. So again, links will be down in the show notes for you. I want to thank two sponsors before we get into the episode. The first one is going to be Viva Rays. You can use code Yogi to save 15% on those. Now, one of the things that we talk about in this episode extensively is those blue blocking glasses. And these are the best ones that I have been able to find as far as quality goes. They even have prescription blue blocking, which if you get a prescription from your doctor, it's not gonna be the same. Any clear lens is not actually going to be a legitimate blue blocker. So again, check out Viva Rays. They're gonna be linked down in the show notes with code Yogi. Second sponsor of today's show is Optimal Carnivore. You can use code carnivore uppercase Y to save on those. And I love their organ meat supplements for filling in nutritional gaps. So make sure you check them out. Again, link down in the show notes. Let's jump into this episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I'm really excited about today's guest. I've never really done anything like this before. I have someone that has done one of my courses and has just been through a lot. I just really respect him a lot, and I wanted to bring him on today. So, uh, Jeremy, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for asking me to come. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you because a lot of my interviews are like doctors and experts. I don't talk to just the everyday person that often, but the, a few things really interested me and I thought my audience could get a lot of, of help and wisdom from your story. You're a registered nurse and you lost a good amount of weight on keto, correct? Yes. I lost 160 pounds on keto. That's okay. So <laughs> that's like an entire person. Yep. Let's talk about that before we jump into anything else. Tell me how that came about and, and what you had to do to lose all that weight. <sighs> So the initial spark was uh, actually when I seen a surgeon for a hernia repair. Oh. And she basically told me that, or well, she basically came into the room and asked me if I was there for gastric bypass. Um, she didn't have, she hadn't looked at my chart, nothing. She just walked in the room, said, you know, are you here for gastric bypass? And when do you want to schedule the surgery for it? And I was like, no, I'm not here for that. I have a hernia that needs to be repaired. Um, she's like, well, if you don't lose the weight, you will be back for gastric bypass. Like she was point blank wow. about it. And I was like, okay, well, I will not be back for gastric bypass. And then that sparked my weight loss journey. You know, I started uh, keto probably like six years ago now or so. Wow. The first year was yo-yo. Like, you know, everyone I think probably goes through that yo-yo unless you have the mentality to be like super strict the whole time. Um, so I'd lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight. But after that point, 
I just got tired of that cycle. And then I just stuck to keto and with keto, like just keto, no working out, nothing like that. Lost probably a good 80, 90 pounds, just that alone. Wow. Wow. Um, and that was not tracking nothing. That was just the only thing I knew was keep my carbs below 20. And that was it. I ate meat, vegetables. That was it. Nothing else pretty much the whole time. Um, so I just kept doing that and I, the weight just kept coming off without the restriction. But then as I progressed, I started going down more of the rabbit hole with keto and then I would plateau and then I would start the whole fasting process. And then I hit a point where I was like, okay, I'm not losing any more weight. I'm tired of doing like alternate day fasting. I was doing three day fast every every so often and then I would do a cycle of alternate day fasting which would be like I would eat dinner one day and then go all the way through until the next you know two days later with that morning eat breakfast type deal wow um, so it was a lot of fasting but then I plateaued out and I was plateaued for at least six months before I did anything more drastic wow and that's when I joined one of the keto groups to lose weight so you did a lot of stuff on your own though, without anyone uh, telling you what to do. You basically just were researching and, and kind of figuring mm -hmm. all this stuff out. Right. Yeah. I, I went through, we'll say, um, a couple of like holistic doctors, a couple of nutritional therapy practitioners. I spent a lot of money with them trying to figure stuff out just mm. in general just trying to figure stuff out stool samples urine samples oh, wow. saliva samples blood work you name it i've pretty much done the testing for it just wow. to figure stuff out to basically find out that well genetically um based on my genetics i'm i should never be eating a high fat diet because that was really? going to make me obese and diabetic yeah, that's what the one group told me, like, based off your genetics, you should not be eating a high fat diet, you should be eating, like, the standard diet. Mm -mm. And I would be obese and diabetic. And that was even after 100 pound weight weight loss that I told them, I was like, I've had 100 pound weight loss with this. And now you're telling me like, it's not it'll never work for me. So that's, you know, I, I, that's why I just really don't love people spending a ton of money on genetic testing mm -hmm. because a lot of those genes are not going to become expressed if you're taking care of your mitochondria and a ketogenic diet actually is very supportive to the mitochondria. You know, you're producing four times more metabolic water. There is higher ATP tr production with a ketogenic diet. So the fact that they would say that you couldn't do that because it's going to express horrible genes means that they mm -hmm. actually don't even know anything about mitochondria, which is way more influential than your D you know, than your genes. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, I, I see a lot of people spending all this money on genetic testing and I did the same thing on my fertility journey. And honestly, it was just a big waste of money. <laughs> yeah, I I, it, it really stunk. Like even one of the NTPs that I've been to, like they they have their own supplement line. So they kind of get you oh, into that. Uh, and yeah, then you're I've spending done that. $1,000 on supplements that they tell you you absolutely have to have. Yep. And I'm just like, oh Lord. And did they ever help? I mean, this is the thing. Did the supplements ever do anything? Yeah, exactly. Nope. Yeah, cause that, that's nope. exactly how I felt with supplements. I mean, some of them cool. They can do like, they can help a little bit. Like I'd take a little C60. Mm -hmm. I think some people can get some help from like methylene blue, things like that, that help with mitochondrial function. But a lot of the, a lot of the supplements is like, you're just chasing your tail and spending money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was doing a full detox with the one group and it was, it was expensive. Yeah. It was not cheap at all. Yeah. Yeah. And then you didn't even get to that desired effect, right? Mm -hmm. No, no. And when it was like, nah, here we go. Like I spent all this money and nothing, nothing had changed. Yeah. Nothing had changed. And that's kind of after those two attempts, it was kind of like, I just need to go back to the basics, you know, my, ba the, you know, the way I used to 
do keto just back to the basics and then start working out yeah so yeah. that's basically what I did after that point yeah and then you had mentioned that you joined a keto group right yes. yeah yes well, let's talk about that just a little bit so that was how I'll say let's see two probably a year and a half ago now where mm -hmm. I joined a, a really well-known keto group and they automatically they put you it's a group setting so it's group coaching and it's like they put you in right into a caloric deficit mm -hmm. and my caloric deficit did not change for six months Ooh. the only thing that would change would be maybe I'll get like every eight weeks a couple of grams of fat and a couple less grams of protein well, but so that was really high protein and not a lot yes, of fat. Yeah. I was at that time over 280 or 260 grams of protein and like 70 to 80 grams of fat. Wow. Wow. And um, how did you feel on that? Those macros <laughs> initially? Okay. So probably like the first eight weeks mentally. Okay. Like I could do it. But after that, like it was not mentally, that's what took the toll on me. It took yeah. me mentally, physically. Yeah. I mean, I was making little to no progress in the gym, like getting my weights up, getting stronger, feeling stronger, but mentally is where it started to break down. Now, during that time, I, I, I had a lot of stressors. Mm -hmm. Like I was in my master's program for nursing um, I had life stress, my other life stressors working, like trying to balance all this stuff. And then you throw into this massive caloric deficit yeah. on top of it. And you're fueling that caloric deficit with lots of coffee. Yes. You know, and not getting enough sleep, not yeah. doing anything for that. And it just was like, I began ruminating and anybody that's in doing weight loss, once you begin ruminating on food and then this oh, is, yeah. it, this is the point where you need to stop yep. and really reverse out of what you're doing. Because it was like, I can no longer focus on my homework. I could no longer focus at work. I could no longer focus in my house. All I thought about was food. Mm. After one meal was done, I was thinking about the next meal after and, or I would, begin procrastinating on my work and just dwell on food or look up. It was so bad that I had to like delete Facebook and Instagram off my phone because I would be looking at people's feeds that were posting. Yeah. And that's what I would do. And in that group, when I told them that they just told me to go for a walk, <laughs> just go for a walk. You got to get your mind away from it. Just go for a walk. And it was like, I just don't think they saw the signs of mm -mm. An, an impending eating disorder. Yeah. I agree. And it happened to me, but it happened to others as well in the group. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. why I wanted to bring you on to talk is because I feel like a lot of these types of things happen in, I mean, in all kind of diet communities, mm -hmm. but from where I'm sitting, you know, I, I have a pretty decent sized following. I get a lot of emails, a lot of um, messages on Instagram this is kind of rampant in the keto and carnivore world. Mm -hmm. And I really want to help people that are in that situation mm -hmm. because they do get gaslighted and they do get kind of brushed under the rug. And I hate to see people hurting. You know, I feel like yeah. when you reached out to me the first time last year or this year, actually, it seems like last yes, year. Yeah, yeah, it's like the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Beginning, like the be middle. Yeah, yeah. Beginning, middle of, of this year. 2021 or 2022. And you were just like, tell me what was going on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, yep. just struggling so hard with you were just hungry all the time and sleep was not good. And just feeling like food was all that you thought about. No. Yeah. In the beginning of the year. So I knew at the end of last year or 2021, that I had to stop doing what I was doing. Like something was gone. Mentally, I was gone uh, with all of the stress from food that I was like, I cannot keep doing this. So I stopped the program. I hired a coach to do a reverse out mm -hmm. because the program didn't offer any of that stuff. So I hired wow. a new coach and that coach helped me reverse back and get me to a point. But during that time, I still had binging episodes. Mm, yeah. And the binging episodes, what people like for me as a binge was like 5,000 calories in a sitting. 
Yeah. And it wasn't 5,000 calorie whole foods. So do you want to make that like it was never 5,000 calories whole foods? It no. was the ketogenic junk food. Yeah. So high fiber, high sugar alcohols, which destroy me Your every gut. time. <laughs> yeah. And it was bad enough where, I mean, in a week, I probably would spend $300 on junk food. Ooh, An excessive yeah. amount. And I would go through, I, maybe I had one binge day this week and I might make it a week, maybe two, but then I would have three or four days the next time. Yeah. And then yeah. I make it a week and then I would have another three or four. Like it was just nonstop. And some days it'd be like, I went, I wait until my, the store open that I would go to and get all this stuff. And then I would go to that store, but then I would go to 7-Eleven right after and buy more ketogenic junk food because they have all the quest products oh the quest like, bars oh god yeah i'd go and i'd buy a ton of those like it was that bad like and i just i had no self-control the yeah. whole time and i i i wouldn't beat myself up while i was doing it it was the day after i was yeah. beating myself up but the whole time i was always journaling and reflecting on it and then i was like something's got to give something in my head has got to give to stop this and then that's when I found your program and I started looking at the leptin stuff because I was like, I just have no satiety at yeah. all. I have yeah. no, no, I'm not even hungry and I'm doing this. Like yeah. I'm not feeling any hunger hormones anymore. So I yeah. have no idea if I'm hungry or not. Just mentally, I'm just like, I want food. Yeah. And that's all I was thinking about. I want food. Yeah. And that's, that happens so much. And I was, I did a live stream this morning and I was talking about how, more and more I'm seeing people in the keto and carnivore space that have this leptin resistance and they may have some weight to lose, but their leptin is actually super low, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I can't have low leptin because I have a little bit of extra weight and I'm just really struggling. And I'm like, well, you're the communication between your fat cells and your brain is completely severed mm -hmm. at this point is totally broken. Your cortisol pattern is a disaster because mm -hmm. of all of this kind of yo-yoing that's been going on for years, you know, and then your body is just kind of living in survival mode at this point. And so, you know, that's the other reason I wanted to bring you on for this chat is because I, you, you're not the only person <laughs> that has dealt with the situation and it's not easy to talk about, especially as a man. You know, mm -hmm. women, we can kind of gab and talk about this stuff. And it's a little bit more like, yeah, you know, it's a girl, you, maybe you got your cycle, your hormonal, whatever men, they don't really come out and speak on these things. And so I feel like it's important that we kind of have a balanced conversation around leptin resistance and that men can absolutely get it. And it can, you know, it's, it's like, you're, there's just literally, like you said, you felt no satiety signals, nothing. You're going on these binges. You don't want to be, and then you kind of go through the shame spiral and it just continues, you know? Um, so yeah. And I remember when we, when I first started talking to you, you were just like, I just wanted to like reach through and be like, Oh my gosh, it's going to be okay. It's going to take some time. But I, I just, you were really honest about how you were struggling. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're just ready to, to do something to change it. Yeah. At that point I was ready to do anything, even if it was like checking myself in for like, you know, an eating disorder, like something yeah. had to give because mentally it was just taking a toll on me physically. Yes. I was gaining weight, but most of the time it's like when you go through a binge and you freak out because you gained five or 10 pounds on the scale the next day, it's all water weight and inflammation. Exactly. It comes so off. like, when I waited that week out, like within the week, like, yeah, I probably would have been like a pound or two heavier by the end of the week if I didn't have any other binges, but I still yeah. lost all that excess water weight and all that inflammation. Yeah. Like, I mean, I did gain, I think like maybe 35 pounds over the last year, maybe a little bit more over the last year um, with all the binging and stuff like that. Yeah. And then then when I started the leptin program, I was more structured in my eating yeah. and I think it slowed down then, but I was eating in a more of a bulk a bulking phase uh, yeah. with my weight loss journey and no longer fasting. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You know, what was it like to somebody that probably did a lot of fasting and breakfast skipping for 
years, I would assume. Years. Years. <laughs> How I was, <laughs> I was a, the perfect person. You don't need breakfast. Breakfast is when you break your fast. Like you can start it at noon. You can get your eating window. I was the perfect person for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now I am not, uh, I will never recommend that to anybody. Let's talk about that. that. Like, how do you feel now with the breakfast and how, first of all, how was that transition? Because that's the biggest pushback I get with people is like, you're like, I can't eat. I feel sick. Like I don't want to do it. And they're, they're afraid also that if they start eating breakfast, they're going to gain massive amounts of weight. So how was that transition? So uh, initially at first, it's, it's definitely a big transition to come from that mentality of you don't eat breakfast. You don't eat breakfast. But after, I would say the first week in the program, that's actually when I started noticing that I was actually hungry Mm -hmm. in the morning. So I actually had those hunger cues in the morning. And it's not like you're not having a period where you don't eat. You're having actually, if you eat based off a circadian rhythm, you're having, you know, 12, sometimes 14 hours where you're just not eating. Yeah. But it's at the back end of your day instead of the beginning of your day. Yeah. Um, So for me, like eating breakfast, I mean, I am the type of person that I can just eat to eat. Like it didn't bother me to eat in the morning. I didn't get nauseated and stuff like that. And I did start out with like um, bigger meals. Yeah. And as the program went on, my breakfast was getting smaller and smaller Mm. and I was getting fuller off of less. Yeah. So I went initially with the the casserole that you make the breakfast casserole yep. with sausage and eggs and all that yeah and I would say a nine by thirteen pan I was getting four days with by the end of it it was more like six days yeah with it and I was feeling more satiated but I was almost always hungry in the morning yeah that's a good which, sign which was definitely fresh air for me because then the binging episodes would go further and further apart where instead of a week or two, now it's a month. Yeah. And even then a binging episode was like, oh, I'm going to have two cookies. That's not, yeah. As opposed to to a case of cookies. Right. Like, and I wouldn't even consider it a binge at that point. It was just more like cravings. Right. And then as time went on, I just kept going further and further. My meals were spaced out, which I had never done before. I just ate to eat, you know? Right. You just pick a time and eat as a nurse it kind of stinks because it's kind of oh, yeah. harder especially an emergency room nurse oh, because yeah. there's no guarantee that we're getting time you know time to eat at that at specific times but I, even doing that like I was able to luck out and just build on it especially during the summer months because sunrise is way earlier yes you know and I start at seven o'clock so oh, yeah when my sun rises at 5 30 I can eat my breakfast pr- right before I start work and then eat my lunch in the middle of my shift yeah and be at least four to six hours from my first meal yeah like within that time frame and that helped me out the most and then as time progressed it just became easier and easier you know I did eliminate coffee during that time I eliminated pretty much every ounce of caffeine you know that I was t- ingesting at that time which was nice like it was definitely good I did have some fatigue during that Mm. time oh yeah um so but I've always had fatigue and until recently I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's ah so and this is so this is another thing for me like um the standard testing for thyroid is oh it's wrong yeah it's not good at all because based off the standard testing, my thyroid was normal. My T4 was normal. My T3 was normal. All of that was normal until I went to a natural medicine doctor and he tested my antibodies. Oh yeah. And those were all abnormal. Ah. So that's my biggest gripe with the TSH testing. Oh yeah. It's always wrong. Yeah. It's like, it's not, it's, it doesn't benefit you at all, especially Mm -hmm. if you have chronic fatigue issues, like it's the one thing that I had to get corrected. And thankfully I was able to get put on meds to help me with it, that issue alone. Good, good. And I think if you keep on doing a lot of the stuff that you're doing, you may be able to see those antibodies go down. I had somebody mm-hmm. just in my group last week, her antibodies went from like 1500 down to 200. 
Yeah. Um, she was doing just all the circadian rhythms, the leptin reset mm-hmm. program. And so I think it's, you know, some people, it depends on their, their history. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to be willing to bet you had high antibodies and Hashimoto's for a while. Yeah. Um, probably because, because of a lot of this stuff, lifestyle wise, being a nurse, very stressful job, you know, mm-hmm. Um, and then the history of, of things go, you know, that you had with the food and the eating and all that, I'm going to be willing to guess that you've probably been struggling with it for a while. And that could have even been causing these binges too, because your body's just like no energy, you know? No, yeah. yeah. Which so. it, I mean, it possibly could have. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. glad that I found the program because it's honestly the, the single thing that changed the trajectory for me last year or this past, this year. Yeah, I'm like so a, glad. I for sure thought I for sure thought I was going to probably binge out the rest of the year. Wow. For sure thought I, I mean, from what I like the stories I hear with people that developing binge eating disorder it takes them years to correct. It's horrible. Yeah. It takes it's them horrible. years to correct, but I think that's because no one truly understands why they're binging. You I know, hope you're binging. enjoying this episode with my friend Jeremy. Again, quick reminder, if any of this is resonating with you and you're wanting to try this leptin reset program, that is going to be linked down in the show notes. And I will be running this live. I don't know when I will do it again because I do have a very young baby, but I will be running the leptin reset live in January. You can email me for more information. You have to have purchase the leptin reset program to get into this cohort but it will be live coaching with a group as well and i am so excited again to share this story that jeremy has dealt with from a male perspective i I know there's a lot of females that have had this same exact situation but i think it's important that we expose the male side as well because sometimes these issues get brushed under the rug and it's like, no, you're not being, you know, manly enough and you should be able to do these things and just buckle up. And I think that exploring this from a male point of view is very, very important. So if this is something that you struggle with or know somebody that's struggling with this issue, please share this episode out, maybe in a Facebook group or in a community on social media, tag me, tag Jeremy, his information's down in the show notes. And I want to thank one more sponsor very quickly for today's sponsorship, Upgraded Formulas. Now, a lot of these issues that people experience on keto and carnivore before they go really south can be root cause in a mineral imbalance. And Upgraded Formulas has an amazing hair tissue mineral analysis that you can get with a consultation so you can pinpoint mineral imbalances with a professional knowing what's actually been going on in your body for the last 60 to 90 days. You can use my code Yogi12 or Yogi if you've used that one before to save on that hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation. Again, thank you to Upgraded Formulas. And let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. You know, they think, hey, I've been in this deficit for so long. And all of a sudden I got this binge eating disorder. I just need to consume more calories. And it's not, it's not necessarily just consuming more. It's planning out when you eat, right? It's getting up, you know, resetting your body. And that's what helped me the most. Like, yeah, it's a struggle in the beginning, you know, especially during the summer, getting up at five, yeah, twenty five twenty five in the morning to make it out by sunrise. But yeah, I honestly, after a while, I just enjoyed it. I got up every day, got out, seen the sunrise. I did a walk and just enjoyed the mornings, you know, and I live in Michigan. So right now it's, it's super cold, but I get my cold therapy in now in the morning because I can't get in my ice barrel. I get in, I just go outside outside. and let the dogs out and just stand out there in the grass for a while and just do grounding and, and then uh, get my cold therapy in that way. That's perfect. You know, it's my friend, um, Carrie Bennett. She's, she and I do some stuff together, course together. She lives up there in Michigan and she's like, you have your cold plunging down there in Georgia, go for it. But I live in Michigan. All I need to do is step outside in the snow and get my cold therapy, get my son. I don't need to plunge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I yeah. love my, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I do love my ice barrel yeah. better than standing out there because for some reason I'm very hot normally. Ah. Um. So for me getting in the ice barrel for five to eight minutes, I just, en- I genuinely enjoy it. Yeah. I think once people like with the cold plunging, and that is something I talk about in the course, it's not required that anyone cold Mm -hmm. plunge, but it is something that can help with leptin levels, believe it or Mm -hmm. not. And 
I think once you start doing it, what it does for your neurotransmitters is so amazing. And that's one of the things that, you know, me, I'm somebody that struggled with binging disorder for years. I mean, Mm. I was, I've lost a hundred pounds, three separate times in my life. You know, I know how to put on weight really quickly, and then I can starve myself and torture myself to take it off. And you, so I've definitely had binging disorder big time. And for me, I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but what the leptin reset does with your neurotransmitters, I think that that's just as powerful, um, as you know, the satiety piece is just like the mental health benefits where you just literally are like, I want to go outside. I want to see sun. You do the cold for the dopamine boost more Mm -hmm. than, than the the fact that it does help you burn off more calories. But at the end Mm -hmm. of the day, you're like, I'd rather just do it because it makes me mentally feel good. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how did that stuff kind of play in for you? So now my weight loss journey is no longer about losing weight anymore. It's about the mental health benefit. Mm -hmm. It's about being the 1% better every day. And the cold therapy is definitely one of those modalities that I will use going forward because it, I don't care that, you know, it increases my weight, my metabolism right. anymore. It's, it's nice to feel that you've done something hard, bright and early. And then the dopamine hit, you get a nice good yep. dopamine hit like from it. And I enjoy it. it yep. All you got to do is get in and uh, yeah, initially it stinks. But yeah, after that, like I feel elated the, most of the day, it's better than any cup of coffee. Yeah, I agree. I agree. My husband still like, I would stand outside. My cold plunge is, is getting here hopefully next week. Um, I ordered one, so it's coming, but I would just stand out on my deck and like sing <laughs> Disney songs. He's like, Oh my goodness, you've lost your mind, but you just mm-hmm. feel so happy afterwards that you mm-hmm. just can't help it, you know? And so anybody struggling with mental health, I feel like a it's, lot of these things should be done for sure. It, it's, definitely been the biggest benefit. I mean, I, like I have anxiety and and depression as just part of my history that it sucks to have, but I mean, I've been med free for two years now. And even going, even going through all of the stress and all that stuff, like I was able to maintain med free the whole time. And which is definitely not something normal. And I did have, you know, like in Michigan, it's gray all the time during the winter months. So the seasonal affective disorder does happen. And it's definitely my biggest struggle is the winter months. Yep. But getting out and just making sure I get whatever sun we do have, like is a big benefit to me. The cold therapy, a very big benefit to me. Yeah. And then I plan on adding some other modalities along the way just to help make it through the winter months. Make the yeah, winter we months a little bit more you easier. A red light panel if you don't have one that h- helps my mental health more than anything in the winter because I, I live in Atlanta so it's not as cold but we definitely have a lot of gray a lot of dark during the winter mm-hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up with you after um winter to see if you kind of implement a lot of this stuff from the left mm-hmm. and reset to see if your depression isn't better this winter because I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna bet that it will be honestly so far so good i have to admit even after going like through my recent surgeries and stuff like that my mental health has stayed intact only thing that's gotten me down is the fact that i cannot lift weights right now i cannot i cannot work out at all i walk yeah and that's just about it and i i can't even walk what i used to walk it's now it's a block or two and then i'm I can't do it much anymore after that. And I try to do that two to three times a day right now. Well, that's, that's the best you can do. And, you know, winter time is really a better time to do more restorative stuff like walking Mm -hmm. and yoga, things like that. Gentle weightlifting instead of the hardcore stuff that we can get away with a lot more in the summer. So maybe it's timed correctly, because if you Mm -hmm. do too much of that stuff during the winter, it can actually pull out your vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm and pull down your immune system. So it might be okay timing mm-hmm. <laughs> that you can't do as much of the working out as you like. Uh, yeah. And I, pro- I, I mean, I can't start back until probably mid January. So I'm just going to enjoy it right now and yeah. just, just walk and build my walking back up. That's my, my goal next year. My goal is to be, do more endurance based stuff. Um, yeah. 
just to build up my cardiovascular endurance because I've noticed that was lacking in my previous years because it was just all weight training, no cardio, no nothing like that. So I'm just trying to try to change up it up a little bit and see how it goes. Yeah. But always, always reflecting on my mental health because that's, that's it's the most my, important. That's where my weight loss journey has taken. You know, everything now is not about losing weight. It's about keeping my mental sanity. It's about yeah. focusing on that. And if it's taking a toll on that, just course correcting when I notice exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, I talked to Dr. Chris Palmer. I'm sure you've seen a lot of his stuff out recently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was telling him when I interviewed him is, is like, yeah, this, you know, being ketogenic and, and a little bit more low carb and a lot of the stuff I do, it can help you to lose weight, but the mental health benefits outweigh the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the weight loss, because if you don't have the mental, I've been super skinny before when I was vegan, you know, I was like the skinniest I'd ever been in my life and thought, okay, you know, being 125 pounds, I'm going to be so happy. And I'm almost five foot eight. So I'm tall, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be so happy at 125 pounds. And I was miserable. I mean, just freaking miserable. I looked good, but you know, if you can have that ideal weight and feel mentally insane and it just doesn't even matter, it's like, it's not worth it mm -hmm. to, to have that body weight. So I think the mental health is really where we need to focus as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we focus on that, the weight loss will come on its own. I agree. Like focus on that. Um, uh, and that like after the leptin reset, like I did the bulking for, We'll say until September, and that's when I decided to start a cut with a with a, another guy. Yeah. Uh, um, and that cut because of the reset that I did, I was actually able to make it eight weeks into that until I had my emergency surgery. Oh gosh! And w without hunger pains, without ruminating, without and the cut was think like I enjoyed the cut because it wasn't like let's hack your calories down to your, what we want it to. And then you're going to ride that out for the next, it, it was like a slow, steady progress. So even when you lost calories, it was 50, 60 calories. Like, oh, wow. And it was, it was, you know, a little bit of fat here, maybe a little bit of protein, like nothing crazy it was sustainable. Yeah. And I would have went the full 12 weeks doing it. And in the eight weeks alone, I lost, I would say like 20 pounds. Wow. Like, so it was like, okay, this is sustainable and it's not taking a toll on me. I'm not having any binges. I'm not having any cravings. And I just, every week, just a little bit of calories off the top. And that was it. Wow. Which that's was great. awesome to feel because I, ne I did not think I would ever, it was the scariest thing I had to do after this past year is yeah. to try to lose some of the body weight. I just... Yeah. I for sure thought I would go into a binging cycle again, but I was like, I need to do this. I didn't care about the weight loss. I cared more about to seeing if I could mentally do it first. Yep. Yeah. And then the weight loss would come naturally. And I knew already going into it that if it became a binge session, it would be a complete reversal. I would go right back to eating like we did an leptin resistance program, like, yep. at, you know, at structured and, and I was still eating structure. I was still eating breakfast. I did not skip breakfast. Good, good. It was, not, <laughs> it was definitely not time to skip breakfast. So every morning, I, and I'm a very easy person to eat. I can eat the same thing day in I'm and the day same out. Way. Yeah. So like for me, it was like eggs, full fat Greek yogurt every morning. Yeah. And I don't even think I ever changed my breakfast. Wow. And my dinner was ground beef. And then I like squashes, so I'll eat some butternut squash. So that was it. And then whatever I decided to put in the middle of the day Perfect. for breakfast. And it was structured meals every time. And I never had a problem. I still had all my hunger hormones. And I just breakfast every morning, lunch around noon, and then dinner around four or five. Like, and it was just stayed the same. And you kept up with sun, ex you know, sun exposure. Yep. I think that makes a bigger difference than anyone really understands. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things I always tell people. It's like, okay, it's too simple to actually be a thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, so you're telling me I go outside during sunrise 
okay, then at UVA, and that's going to make a difference on my mental health and help me with hunger hormones and those, those types of things mm-hmm. now, but it, it actually does make a, a difference, right? Mm-hmm. It genuinely made a difference for me getting up, getting the hunger hormones back, seeing sunrise every day. Like it genuinely made, I, I mean, I was skeptical going in because no one really talks about leptin. Right. It's not, it's not a thing. So resetting it, like definitely not a thing. Right. And I, when I took the program, like, I I mean, I was skeptical to begin with, but after a while it was like, holy, like I can, like, I feel mentally normal now. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Like for me, it was, it's perfect. Even working in an emergency room, like I get in now before sunrise yeah, but it stinks because then I'm I'm stuck with all the artificial lights. But when as soon as my my phone goes off, like for sunrise, like I go out there for a couple of minutes. Yeah, and just get the sunrise in. That's At least so I good. get that, and then throughout the day I'll go out and get Take a couple minutes walk. Yep, that's perfect. Just to enjoy all of that stuff, and that's it's been working for me. That's like so I good. cannot complain. And I think people, they're like, I have this job and I can't do it perfectly. And so if I can't do it perfectly, then I probably shouldn't do it at all. And it doesn't work like that. Just getting that signal from the sun and having that communication process happening with the body and the brain. I always say quantum is like a small little thing that you do that yields a really large result. And so you're still keeping all these little quantum habits throughout your day. And it does create a change correct mm-hmm. yeah yep it did definitely did for me that's for sure yeah so and i wasn't is... expecting it but it it made a big <laughs> change for me it made yeah. a big change for me i think it's a hard sell because i always tell people you know when i first heard about the carnivore diet it was from dr rimka mm-hmm. she's a friend of mine she lives like just a few miles yeah, away from live, here yeah live far i know that Yeah. She's, she lives close by and she kind of talked me into carnivore, but she was also at the same time telling me if I wanted to do carnivore to do sunrise and to have morning light time and wear blue blockers and all these other things. And I was like, oh, that's stupid. I'm just going to do the food. And I struggled Mm -hmm. for, you know, I had some good changes on carnivore. I had some good things happen, but I still was struggling a lot and then ended up with the weight loss resistance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I had just listened to her from day one, (laughs) that it would have been a lot easier. And I might not have run into some of the stuff that I ran into um, if I had just listened in the beginning and not had to come to it on my own. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like I, I think that my last plateau, the six month, if I would have stopped doing all the fasting and started like eating in a normal manner, even ketogenic normal manner, that I probably would have broke through that plateau because I was already working out then. Um, and it was a consistent working out. So, but I think I would have broke through my weight loss plateau, just getting out, seeing the sunlight and then eating in a structured manner for a while. I think I would have broke through it because then all of my hormones wouldn't have been so out of cortisol yeah cortisol which i've had that tested multiple times and blood work it was always normal but i've had saliva normal yeah saliva and urine and um by like midday with those i was already 1.5 times the normal person's level and my melatonin level was half that of a normal person so like i was always struggling with that and i've done I mean, I do blue light blocking glasses. I cold room, chili pad. I do, I mean, everything I can do for my sleep stuff, but it ne- it hadn't changed anything with that. So then I went down the rabbit hole with supplements like cortisol, or cortis or and some other ones. Oh yeah, all the adaptogens. and, and Doing yeah. all of that stuff. And it just, none of that stuff really worked. And my sleep got better doing the leptin program. Yep that's where I saw the biggest change because I was having full weeks where I was just like, I 10 o'clock I'm in bed, 9 30, 10 o'clock in bed every time. And I would get amazing sleep. Like the best sleep I had gotten in probably years waking up, feeling refreshed and then waking up without an alarm clock. Wow. Like I would, if I was in bed by nine 30, I was pretty much guaranteed to be up by five, 10 in the morning. Yep. Like without an alarm clock, nothing waking me up. And I just enjoyed that. Like, 
and that's that's helping right now uh, get back to it because after my surgery like a lot of things a lot of things change because they sure in the heck don't let you sleep in no the in the hospital no it's the worst environment for sleep it's horrible all the artificial lights oh yeah all yep. of the you know blood draws all of the yep. not the greatest food oh yeah and it just and then the prolonged fasting i was put on during i mean i was back to back fasting Oof. two to three days each time i was in there and i was in there two times in the same week so it was just wow. like excessive amount of fasting wow. during that time it was needed yeah um because of the surgeries but it was just so much yeah so. Yeah. That when I had my son, I could not get out of that hospital fast enough. Like I, ch I chose a hospital that was an hour away from my house, even though there's like plenty of hospitals around mm -hmm. here, because I know they have a policy that as long as you have an uncomplicated birth, you can be out within 24 hours mm -hmm. and they don't push like a hep lock. If you're not going to get an epidural, if you're not going to mm -hmm. get the drugs, they don't make you get a hep lock. So I was like, that I'm going to that hospital. I almost had my baby in the car because we were trying to get there in rush hour, mm -hmm. but I was so glad I chose that because I didn't realize it until I was in the hospital of like, oh my gosh, there's lights everywhere. They even have like lights under the bed now to make it like mm -hmm. they would change colors. I'm like, this is not cool. Like it'd be like blue and green in the middle mm -hmm. of the night. I'm like, oh my God, I can't, this is awful. How do people mm -hmm. stay in the hospital for prolonged times? Like, and actually heal. Like you, it's, it's so mm -hmm. hard. So I was wearing my blue light blocking glasses from 24 seven in the hospital, at least sundown to sun up. Like even oh, when yeah. I was trying to sleep because they would come in there and they would, oh, yeah. you know, wake you up. And then like, I wore a sleep mask. So yeah, yeah. I would just keep taking it on and off, on and off. And I just like, I just wear my dang blue light blocking glasses at this <laughs> yeah. point. And that way I could at least get two to three hours of sleep without being, you know, yeah. and then get woken up and then you won't get hit by all the lights. Yeah. It's a horrible environment. It really yeah. is. But I feel like now hopefully you're home and you're on the road to recovery and, um, yeah, just just continuing to. I'm sure it's been difficult to get back out to sunrise and all that stuff now. But I think now that you're home, you're going to be able to do that and hopefully mm -hmm. keep seeing improvement in your cortisol levels and melatonin and yep. yeah. And that's the thing you have to do saliva tests. It's not going to show up on a blood test with cortisol. You have to test it throughout the day. Throughout the day, yep. Yeah, and that's the thing I find with a lot of people that do these types of behave. You know, the the fasting and the restriction for mm -hmm and the coffee for breakfast and skipping breakfast, that's what ends up happening is their cortisol gets unnaturally high early on in the day. And then it jumps off a cliff or it'll go up again at night and compete with melatonin. And it just like their patterns are just a complete disaster. And so mm -hmm. that circadian aspect and then the meal timing aspect that those are the things that are going to help more than adaptogens. And everyone mm -hmm. wants the supplement that's going to be the cure for the cortisol but i mean <laughs> yeah yeah every, everybody does and everybody i've known has just pushed it like i mean supplements can be great but I they're not the you, cure they, i think you just got to go back to the basics yeah you know good yeah. sleep hygiene yeah. making sure you're consistent with your sleep timing keeping the room cool so you're not sweating all night long yeah. you're not you know your core temperature is actually decreasing like it's supposed to yeah. and then getting up at, to see sunrise yeah. you know doing those things and you'll have better success than the supplements yeah I mean, and the blue was, blockers too the blue block yeah the blue blockers definitely because i was using i did i do have an aura ring so yeah. that was one of the things the chili pad and those were the biggest things that made a difference in my hrv oh wow the blue like blockers the and blue the blockers and the chili pad. Yeah. Wow. And I tried amazing. everything, <laughs> every sleep supplement I can do. I was doing, you know, the magnesium, I was doing melatonin. I was doing like CBD. I was doing all of those yeah. things because all of them were recommended for yeah. sleep and none of those would change my HRV. Yeah. None of them. Yeah. Only things that did were the chili pad and the blue blockers. That's so amazing. I've gotten so many messages like that. I had a guy just last night that he's like, I just started wearing the blue blockers with it. And within two weeks, my HRV just completely jumped up. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a coincidence? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. that simple because 
the light signals, blue and green light actually boost your cortisol, red mm -hmm. and amber light is not going to cause your cortisol to be out of control. So when it's dark outside, you need to have darkness inside and, and protect your eyes. That's going to help your cortisol, believe it or not, and melatonin. Mm -hmm. So yep, yeah, it's the, it's the two things that I do recommend people getting at least cooling your room down to make sure it's cold enough. I find for me because oh, yeah, I, I'm so warm all the time that my mattress it just radiates the heat back into me. So I just will sweat all night long. So the chili pad for me was kind of a must at yeah. that point because it, I just, I always sweat at night. Yeah. And then the blue light blocking glasses, those things. I mean, if you had to make one purchase, I would do at least do the blue light blocking glasses, at Definitely. least do that because you're going to be up through the, you know, part of your evening. So you're going to be exposed to it all night long. If you don't have something to protect your eyes. Definitely. I agree. That's what I tell people. And, you know, I have two brands that I love that are a little more pricey, but you can get a cheap pair and still see a difference. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you want to get the nicer brands, I love those. I use those, but you can even just get a cheap pair and get started immediately. Mm -hmm. If, if, you know, the money is an issue and you're like, mm -hmm. I can't invest all this money in the glass, just get something cheap and just start you know? yeah. yeah yeah and don't believe that your eye your normal eyewear like prescription glasses no. that, that's blue light blocking because it's no, definitely not it's not because I, that's what i have i wear for far for you know because i'm nearsighted yep. so yeah i wear that for that purpose but it does not do anything for blue light blocking no, I get that question a lot like oh my doctor put blue light blocking in my prescription i'm like no mm. that's not <laughs> In all honesty, it's just another <laughs> no, waste of money. Like you it just is. get some regular glasses if you need them. Like I yep. plan on getting prescription strength blue light blocking glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because now that I've seen a couple other brands that offer it. Yeah. Especially the Viva Rays. Like, yeah, that they have it. It's nice. They yep. they have it. But they like I like the whole magnetic part of it because I, I yep. do like to wear my glasses at work. Yeah. To see the monitors and stuff like that. So I get the benefit of all having all three pairs. Yeah, I would definitely get those if I had to wear prescription glasses because yeah, you can pop on the orange, you can pop on the red, and then the base layer is something that you can wear at work, you mm -hmm. know, as well, that's going to help. So, and they even have like uh, prescription glasses now that allow UV rays to come in, which is oh. pretty interesting. Yeah, because yeah. most prescription glasses are going to block out UV, which is you know, if you're outside walking around, you don't really want to block that out through your mm -hmm. eyes. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, um, I feel like we've talked about so many awesome things. One question I wanted to ask you as a nurse, um, somebody that's in the healthcare field, how do you, do you ever talk to your patients about any of this stuff at all? Do you ever feel called to, or I definitely do. Yeah, it is. It is a big thing for me because I get a lot of patients that are sick, obviously. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. in the emergency room, I wish I had more time. That's what I was going to say because you're an emergency room nurse. Yeah. So when I do get the time, it's I just enjoy talking about it because, I mean, we get patients of all walks of life yeah. that have been through the ringer for everything. And sometimes even just sitting, talking to them about that, like it makes their day better, even though it's yeah. not even what they're there for, Yeah, you know, yeah. and I just enjoy talking to them about what, you know, my weight loss journey and, and doing all this stuff. And most of the time it comes up because I see a lot of people on specific meds to lose weight yeah. and all that stuff, you know, and I, I definitely love talking to diabetics the most. Oh yeah. Um, just getting them a better understanding of, you know, if you're going to eat carbohydrates, which obviously we already know that it's probably not the best thing for them, at least eating your protein before you do the carbohydrates and making sure you get protein at every meal. Yes. You know, to at yes. least help keep those spikes, those, those glucose spikes lower. Yeah, I agree. That's the one thing people are like, what's the optimal way to eat for hormones? I'm like, Protein, good quality animal protein has to be in every single meal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if you're going to eat carbs, eat them last, try to stick mm -hmm. to local seasonal, you know, right now, winter squashes, mm -hmm. things like that. But you got to have that good, high quality animal protein in order mm -hmm. to help your, your leptin, your hormones, insulin, all those things need it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's, I just enjoy talking to them about that stuff. So that's usually where the conversation goes, but I don't get to spend enough time doing that. 
Yeah, I know it's hard. And, you know, as I was just saying on my live stream, I feel like nurses are people that give their heart and service, you know, Mm -hmm. they're helping people on a daily basis, yet they're some of my sickest clients that they, their health really takes a hit because they're stuck in the hospital. You know, it's harder for them to regulate circadian rhythms and things like that, Mm -hmm. Uh, meal timing, and a lot of them do night shift. And so I'm curious if any of your nurse friends, if you've talked to them about some of the things that you do and influenced anybody just yet. I mean, I've, I've had people that have went down the ketogenic role because of my weight loss and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, some of them fall off, which yeah. is, it is, I mean, it, sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow to see, you know, yeah. even when you see somebody who's successfully done it to do something that can, they consider more restriction than oh, yeah. they would like, or it's not sustainable yeah. or you got poor coping mechanisms, you know, because of how stressful our jobs can be. Like it just, everyone has to find their why in doing it. And yeah. that's, you know, I do talk to them about it uh, regularly because I'm the guy that's lost so much weight in the ER. Yeah. So it yeah. always comes up. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, this has been really awesome. I don't even feel like an hour has passed. Oh, I didn't think an hour passed. I know yet. it's like fifteen minutes, but um, you know, if people want to follow you, I know you've got an Instagram account. Um, how could people follow you and 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 see more progress on your journey? Right now, the really the only place I post is on Instagram, and that's okay. Jeremy J E R E M Y dot L C H F dot R N. Awesome. And I'll make sure to include that in the show notes for everybody. So if they want to follow you, but Jeremy, I really, really appreciate you coming on and um, just talking with me, being honest about all this stuff. And I I know it's going to help a lot of people on their journey as well. Well, I thank you for bringing me on and I thank you for the program the most. It really saved me last year or this year. It really saved me. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, thank you. Thank you.